uh, the, everyone to the committee's 14th meeting in 2019. Could I ask people present please to make sure their mobile phones are on silent? The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. The committee has asked to consider taking item three in private. This is to allow the committee to discuss its responses to an EU, sorry, to a letter from the Finance and Constitution Committee on EU-related scrutiny. Mike Rumbles, I believe you have a comment on this. Thanks, Convener. Yes, <clears throat> I think on this particular occasion, only for this occasion, I'm not sure it's appropriate to go into private session, simply because the seven-page letter from the Finance Committee is already in the public domain, and all that we're being asked to do is suggest some general principles of effective scrutiny to the committee rather than seeking to provide detailed responses to each question asked. And, I, and considering that we're doing the restricted roads 20 mile an hour quite correctly in, in private session, I just think it, it skews our business to, to some extent, and I would suggest that we keep this in open session, this particular Thank item. Thank you, Mike. Richard, you wanted to say something? Yes, uh, on, I, I think uh, I, I agree with Mike uh, Rumbles on this occasion in regards to this. It's about the EU withdrawal-related scrutiny, and I think we should be discussing it in public. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the basis that uh, the members that have spoken have spoken in favour of doing it in, in public session and no one's spoken against it, does the committee agree that we should do it in public? It seems reasonable to me uh, for transparency point of view that, that people can see what the committee are doing and what our views are on this particular subject. Yes. Okay, so we'll, we'll take that in uh, public session. I therefore want to move on to agenda item two, which is subordinate legislation. This item is to consider one negative interest, uh, negative instrument as detailed on the agenda. Uh, no motions to annul or representations have been received in relation uh, to this instrument. I believe, Stuart, you want to say something, Stuart? Um, yes, I'm fully supportive of this and don't wish to uh, stand in its way at all. Um, I, I've uh, identified, however, there are 14 references, and I may have missed some, um, to various uh, European legislation in the order that's laid before us. And I just would like the government to assure us that they are uh, keeping this one on its list of things that will have to be changed if and when the UK actually leaves uh, the EU. It's worth making the point that it was actually made on the 26th of March, three days before the original departure date, but, but nonetheless it has these 14 references. Um, I, I don't want to change anything that it does, but uh, just uh, that general point. Does anyone else? Uh, Peter. Sorry for not saying earlier, convener, but uh, I need to declare an interest as a, as a partner in the farming business. But in the paragraph 19 of the thing, it speaks about the termination of the age of sheep or goats. Now, there was, there was a proposal that the, the way that you determined whether a lamb was, was uh, over a year old, rather than going through the dentition, as we've had, had to do in the past, it would be that any, uh, after the 30th of June, all lambs would be considered to be a, a year old. And I know the industry was, it was keen that that was, was brought into, into being because it, it means that uh, it's much simpler to determine when a, a lamb is a year old. And it also means that there's, uh, it's about splitting the carcass for taking out uh, specific risk material. It, it mentions that here, it's, it's, the method will be, of ageing will be approved by Scottish ministers. Um, I, I'm pretty well, I pretty much know that the, the UK government has decided not to go down this road, although the industry would love it to go down this road. I just wonder if there's going to be a different uh, regime north and south of the border. Do okay. we know? Could we ask? Okay. Um, does anyone else have any comments? Okay, so I think, um, and because I'm now talking uh, in response to the thing, I will declare an interest in, in that I'm a farmer, but I'm only responding to the comments made. I think that the committee should write to the government, or I propose the committee writes to the government to ask the questions raised by Stuart Stevenson regarding uh, EU legislation. And I think it would also be helpful if the clerks wrote on behalf of the committee to the government asking uh, for the government's position on, on how they will do... Um, the determination of, of the age of, of lambs and sheep. But uh, the, no one's spoken against the instrument and things, so I, I think our general feeling is that we should... Um, we, we, there aren't any recommendations apart from the ones that I've made regarding writing to the government. Is, is that the committee's view? Yes. Are we agreed? Yes. 
Okay, we are agreed. Thank you. So we now move on to agenda item three, which, uh, three, which is EU withdrawal related scrutiny. And the Finance and Constitution uh, Committee has invited other committees to provide their views on the Scottish Parliament's scrutiny role in relation to the new powers that would arise from the UK's withdrawal from the EU. This is to consider how the REC Committee could respond to this uh, letter. Options are set out in paper two, which forms part of your papers. And I want to ask the committee's view on whether and how to respond to the Finance Committee in relation to three areas. The, first of all, the UK government's making regulations certain devolved areas, international trade treaties, common UK frameworks, and whether, it, if there's anything else, um, that highlight any other issues. Um, there are some suggestions in the papers, and I really would just like to invite comments from, from the committee. Um, and John Finney is first followed by Stuart Stevenson. Um, uh, thank you. I, I think it's a helpful paper, and, and I think, uh, in fact, given the previous thing we heard from Mr Chapman there about um, how uh, the movement of livestock and indeed the, the, the trade in livestock is international, I think with regard to paragraph 12 where the question is posed there about whether we should have a role I think uh, I'm very clear that the Scottish Parliament should have a role in scrutinising the impact of future international trade treaties on devolved areas. In fact, I think it would be entirely remiss if we didn't. So I would like that to be stressed. Please, Camina. OK. Um, Stuart. Um, yes, I, I, there are three references in the papers that are in front of us to that subject, which is exactly the one uh, I wanted to address. Um, the, the, we are asked, and specifically the committee will welcome views on and then it goes on. As a matter of principle, the Scottish Parliament, as a minimum, I underline that, must be consulted prior to consent being given by Scottish ministers to exercise of the powers. And I think that is something I would absolutely support as a minimum. I, I would go further than that, however, um, in that uh, the, 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 there are some precedents of which I'm aware, and I'm sure there'll be others of which I'm unaware, uh, where there is co-decision making among the jurisdictions. Uh, in, the, in the British Isles. In particular, for example, small point I accept, that there has to be unanimity when appointments are made to the UK Climate Change Committee. And as a minister, I had to deal with a circumstance where initially there was not unanimity and we got to unanimity. And also, there are some cross-border uh, institutions which require sign off north and south of the border. The, U, the uh, British Waterways Board was an example where I, as Minister, found myself having to authorise the sale of land in Birmingham. I didn't think that was a particularly useful thing for me to be doing, but that's the way it worked. So there are, there, there are principles uh, that, that uh, in relation to that. And I just leave the other comment as uh, almost sticking to the wall. <coughs> Um, while I've got a much simpler approach to, to, to this issue, which I won't rehearse for members, I do think where matters are uh, related to the interests of the various parliaments and assemblies in these islands, that, and given that perhaps at Westminster, and I don't think this is unduly controversial, uh, there is a case for reform down there in the way things are done, that it may be time to visit the subject of joint committees uh, between the various parliaments when it is an issue of joint interests. Because it's all very well governments having um, you know, ministerial committees that allow ministers to liaise. But I think, I think bluntly, you know, some of the liaison is really about parliamentarians and parliament. And, and that touches on this same subject as a possible I, way I, you could deal with it. I, th I think we have to be careful when we're considering this, that this was a letter on EU withdrawal-related scrutiny, and that may go beyond that. Um, Richard, you wanted to make a comment followed by John Mason. Yes, I, I, as I say, based on the fact that the, the, the paper that's in front of us and the Finance and Constitution Committee has asked for our, uh, um, options on this, in regard to the, uh, the legislation, I agree that the um, Finance and Constitution Committee should consider extending its scope to cover all relevant future UK legislation. In regard to international treaties, again, I agree that the Scottish Parliament should have a role in scrutinising the impact of future international treaties in devolved areas in particular. Uh, if we're going to come out of the EU, well, we should be consulted. And basically, in the common UK frameworks, again, I agree with the 
the paper and believe that we should be involved. Uh, thanks, Convener. Yes, this also came up at the Economy Committee yesterday and we took evidence from Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Um, I mean, I think in an ideal world, yes, there should be parliamentary scrutiny of what both governments are doing. Um, I think the reality is we know that the relationship has varied at times from being good to not so good between the two governments, and that makes it difficult in practice. There was one case where uh, John Swinney, as the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, uh, was disagreeing with Down South about, I think it was an adjustment to the block grant, and they had a phone call and they split the difference. So, you know, that kind of decision is very difficult to really scrutinise by any committee. And I, I think the point was also made that different UK government departments do vary as to how cooperative they are and how open they are. Um, the, the, another point that was made, which I agree with, is that there really needs to be a framework for framework agreements. And I think that falls within Mike Russell's remit, uh, whereas obviously the individual cabinet secretaries and ministers will then deal with particular departments. Okay, um, Mike, you wanted to... <clears throat> I, I think firmly our job in the Scottish Parliament as parliamentarians is to scrutinise the Scottish Government's actions. That's what our role is, and I think that's what we should be focused on. Uh, but on the specific questions of these, these three areas, um, I know paragraph 11, if everybody's got it in front of them, I, I think that's a bit too harsh, that um, it says propose a statutory requirement that new trade agreements must be agreed by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament. That, to me, looks like a veto on reserve matters, so I don't think that's appropriate. But what I do think is appropriate is that we have established between um, Scottish Government and the UK Government a protocol as to how to work through this process because we have this mix of reserve matters and devolved matters. And I think if we start demanding that you know, we have a veto on this or a veto on that. I don't think that's helpful to try and get an agreement between the UK government and Scottish government in practical terms. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, followed by John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Um, just turning to page eight of our committee papers on this and the letter from the Finance Constitution Committee, which is actually the fourth page of the letter. Uh, in the bullet points, uh, the last bullet point uh, is discussing uh, what process should be in place to enable the Scottish Parliament to scrutinise all UK legislation which confers powers on UK ministers. It then talks about the protocol which applies to the EU Withdrawal Act and that it may be a starting point in that conversation. I'm unclear as to which bit of the EU Withdrawal Act, presumably that would be the Westminster Act, not the one passed by the Scottish Parliament, which protocol we've been asked to consider. It's quite a detailed and lengthy bill, and I think it would have been helpful perhaps if we were given some bullets as to what that process is or what, what the suggestion is that may help us to consider whether that's an appropriate protocol or not. That's the um, first point. Sorry, I, I, th I think on that, that's the protocol that the, the Scottish Parliament agreed regarding the classification of uh, SIs. Perhaps you, you could clarify that. Yeah. Yeah, we've been operating the protocol in relation to UK SI consent notifications that we'll be familiar with. What we're suggesting is that that may be a useful starting point to look beyond the withdrawal and how we manage these future SIs as they come forward, perhaps building on that, developing a similar uh, protocol to, to handle those. Therefore, that would be on the assumption that the committee and the other committees are content with the process as it currently stands. Mm -hmm. And I think largely some of the feedback in other committees that I've that I've sit on or, or other members that I speak to, um, uh, you know, the, the sheer volume of SIs that are, are coming through. This is a point I raised with Mike Russell last week in the Europe Committee, and I think it was accepted uh, that it's, it gives us very little room for proper scrutiny of the SIs due to the time factors and the volume. So uh, using the protocol as a starting point is one thing, but whether or not that protocol in its current form is working for Parliament is entirely another. I don't know if any other members, did, did any members have a comment on that? Uh, but before sure, before I move on to my next yeah, point. Yeah, I know, I know you've got another point. If this is the right moment, uh, it was just, and John, I've got It was just a very, very small point that where UK SIs come before us, our processes here mean they have not gone to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee as everything else would. So I think there are various options as to how to 
look forward with this when it happens again, on which I'm not taking a particularly definitive view. Okay, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, my next point uh, relates to uh, international treaties, which is the second area that uh, uh, the letter asks, asks us to review. Um, <clears throat> it's really asking for our views on the role of the Parliament in scrutinising the <coughs> impact of future international trade treaties. It's not asking us necessarily for direct input into the negotiation of the treaties. It's, it's around the impact. And I think that's a fair ask. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate that where uh, future treaties uh, involve areas of competence in this committee, i.e. in particular uh, fisheries, uh, agriculture related elements of those negotiations, that we do consider them. Now, the level of output and, and our influence in those negotiations is, is another matter. Um, but we only need to look at, for example, the 2016 example of the EU-Canada deal, which uh, faced uh, a number of difficulties uh, in its um, uh, sign-off processes due to the perhaps lack of clarity as to the role of uh, uh, parliaments within member states and the role that they play in the negotiation of those treaties, the example I cite being Wallonia. So I, th I think there's an important discussion to be had around the role of the Scottish Parliament uh, uh, albeit it, uh, the, the negotiation of the treaty is a, perhaps a reserved matter, as, as some might say. Um, and the last point was around common frameworks, um, and it was just really uh, uh, something I think that's come up time after time, and that's the, the, the discussion around whether or not the Scottish Government could or should create divergent policy matters in areas where there is disagreement between the UK and the Scottish Government, and it's fair to say there are in the buckets of... Uh, areas of responsibility, there, there will inevitably be disagreement as to whether uh, something sits as, as a devolved or reserved matter as it is transposed from the EU back to these islands. So um, I think our job really as a committee is just to scrutinise the Scottish Government's uh, approach uh, to these, uh, these policy matters, uh, in my view, with a view to, to try and avoid uh, divergent policy, however be respectful of the fact that each constituent part of the UK may have differing needs and we should respect that as well. Uh, John. I think the debate as far as it has been very good and it illustrates that we all know each other's position on the constitutional matter. We would all accept the procedural what would be ruled as being reserved. And, but I would like to draw members, because I chose my words very carefully and I said I think we should have a role. And the reason I said that is because if I read out paragraph 9 to you, it says the UK government has committed to establishing a formal mechanism for UK and devolved government ministers to discuss and provide input to future trade negotiations. Now, it's entirely competent that we... Uh, so, by default, if we are scrutinising the minister that's having input, we are having a say in the input. And if we take last week, for instance, the Cabinet Secretary and what he talked about in the event of a no deal in relation to the disastrous effect that would have with World Trade Organization tariffs for our lamb industry. I, th I think it's, it's, it's around these areas that I, I think we are all agreed. I think it would be disappointing if we got hooked up on some of the constitutional issues here, because it certainly seems that the UK government, as it says, is, is committed to hearing the views. And it's important that we scrutinize the input from ministers. Does, does anyone else have any comments? Um, I, I, I've got a, a general comment. I, I mean, I, I find it quite interesting um, as convener of the committee sitting and, and seeing all the paperwork coming through re relating to the various uh, instruments that we have to consider and, and LCMs. And, and it's, it's a point I've made before, and I can see uh, the clerks saying he's going to say that again. Yes, I am. It's about the amount of paperwork that we get and the clarity of the paperwork. And one of the things I would like to see the committee go back and, and uh, ask for is when we're doing this scrutiny is that the papers are laid out in such a way that they are easily readable. I mean, in some stage, the, the paperwork um, exceeds the legislation by multiples of 10 per page. That, to me, is unhelpful. And I have found it sometimes very difficult, even with my experience uh, previously as uh, somebody involved in land and man, to even understand what land management processes are being put forward in the legislation. So I, I would like the committee to consider including in that a simplification of the paperwork process um, to allow our uh, position 
of scrutiny to be done more effectively. And, and truthfully, as a committee, we have done more uh, instruments and, and than any other committee apart from the DPLR who's considered the, them all. We, we have got more than our fair share of them. So I think, uh, uh, you know, some of the paperwork, as you know, has been massive. So I'd like to do that. What I propose uh, is uh, ask the clerks to draft up a response um, based on what we've heard today. I think it should be quite focused, and, I, and I'm pleased um, that uh, John Finney's made the point that it, it, it should be focused on the, on the process of scrutiny, um, and we shouldn't get hung up in... in uh, any constitutional issues because it, it's had to make that effective. So what I would propose is the clerks draft something up and circulate that um, with the papers um, for a future meeting um, within the guidelines. I'm not tying them down to it because we've got quite a lot on. So, But I'll talk to the clerks and we'll find out when the appropriate uh, moment is to, to have that ready. Um, does anyone else have any comments on that? Um, then I propose that we move on to agenda item four, um, uh, which is a matter to be taken in private. Therefore, I would like to uh, move the meeting into private. <laughs>